Okay, so as I mentioned, we have three speakers today that will provide tips for how to apply for CDMRP funding. Dr. Applin has been quite successful at applying for funding and achieving funding from CDMRP, and he'll share his tips. Uh, Ed Ackerley, as I mentioned, is a program administrator at uh, Notre Dame and has been well uh, versed in uh, dealing with uh, submitting grants to the DOD. And Dr. Holbert will share an overview of the CDMRP and the Melanoma Research Program. So just a few de details about MRA. It was founded in 2007 with the mission of finding cures for melanoma and collaborating with all stakeholders, patients, uh, providers, care providers, uh, investigators and in industry to accelerate finding cures for melanoma. And MRA is the largest nonprofit funder of melanoma research worldwide. And 100% of the donations to our foundation go directly towards melanoma research funding. So MRA collaborates with a lot of different organizations to advance melanoma research. And one of those organizations is the DOD. Um, the De Department of Defense Melanoma Research Program. We are collaborating with them to uh, market this funding opportunity. Uh, CDMRP is uh, committed to diminishing the disease burden of melanoma on service members, veterans, and the general population. And about, uh, it's melanoma has been the leading form of cancer in active duty members of the armed forces from 2005 to 2015, and it's commonly, one of the more commonly diagnosed forms of cancer among veterans. So for this fiscal year, the Melanoma Research Program intends to fund and award um, about $40 million of research funds towards melanoma research. So I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Holbert, who will be discussing the funding opportunities. Yeah, thank you, Tanisha, and a huge thank you to Andrew Applin and Ed Ackerley for joining us. Um, I think, and, and thank you to all the audience that's joined us today. You can see there's an enthusiastic about 30 or 40 people online. Um, you know, I think that the melanoma research program of the DOD is one of the most significant things to happen to the melanoma research field. It went from $5 million a few years ago to now $40 million in this annual RFP. And I don't want to read... Um, this is uh, from their website, but essentially they have several award mechanisms. Uh, the IDEA award, uh, unfortunately that due date has passed was July 8th, but all the rest of them have a September 14th deadline. And so we're hopeful that today you can learn some tips about applying to them. They have this Melanoma Academy Scholar Award, which you can see the details there. Um, Tanisha, we'll, we'll distribute this to everyone that registered after the call. Um, if you go to the next slide, they also have um, a mid-career um, investigator award, which I think is really exciting. You know, we've heard it as a funding organization. We've heard that there is this gap between uh, new faculty members that are eligible for uh, early career development awards, like our MRA Young Investigator Award, and full professors. And so I think this mid-career category is outstanding. Um, they also have a team science award, which you can see the details there. And then um, lastly, uh, on the next slide, Tanisha, they have um, the Rare Melanomas Special Program. And I think what's uh, critical to point out here with the Rare Melanoma Program, in this mechanism, they actually do allow pilot clinical trials, which is not allowed in the other mechanisms, and um, a focus um, of up to $2 million to advance research on rare melanomas. So um, again, I think they have a variety of important award mechanisms um, to start uh, from early faculty that could join the academy, to mid-career investigators, to team science awards. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's incredible the amount of resources and effort that the DOD is putting behind melanoma research. And I'm looking forward to this conversation with Dr. Applin and Ed Ackerley. Thank you, Mark. So now we will take a few questions. Uh, for Dr. Applin, I'll start off. And if you have questions, you can unmute yourself to ask a question or you can 
place a question in the chat and we will uh, ask it for you. So Dr. Applin, you've been successful in applying to and receiving CDMRP funding. What words of advice would you give to colleagues that have never before applied to CDMRP? Firstly, thank you for having me. And I'd like to also say thank you to the, the Department of Defense for, uh, I think, supporting melanoma research in a really substantial way. Um, and to the Melanoma Research Alliance and Melanoma Research Foundation for really advocating for support um, from the Department of Defense. I'm hoping that we as a research community can really meet the expectations of the patients and caregivers. Um, you're right that, that um, my group has been um, successful in obtaining grants from the DOD. We've obtained both IDEA awards and team science awards. And uh, so I'll just give you uh, a little bit of the strategy that, that I've had in terms of thinking about those awards and then some of the mechanisms that I think have helped. Um, I think it's important to note when thinking about applying to the GOD, they have quite important criteria and areas, pri priority areas that they're, they're looking to fund. They have essentially reimagined the idea of prevention and they have a um, document on their website that really lays out the way that they're thinking about prevention in terms of early detection, um, blocking the spread of primary tumours, um, mechanisms of dormancy, and then, as you've highlighted, the um, areas of, of supporting rare melanomas. So it's important that the, the research that you're proposing really fits into one of those um, major research areas that are listed on the, the DOD website. The IDEA awards have to be out of the box. They're looking for high risk, high reward um, uh, projects. They're not looking for an incremental advance on a project that is already ongoing. And so for the IDEA awards that um, I've uh, um, submitted, I had very little preliminary data. Um, it was often bioinformatic analysis that generated a hypothesis that I then laid out a plan that I would test. Um, so that's for the idea award. You know, really out of the box ideas. Um, it's not supposed to be incremental. For the team science awards, um, they're looking for, a, a, in my opinion, a more translational project, a very translational project, um, with investigators that have got complementary expertise. I think it's advantageous if those investigators are already working together. Um, that's my sense. Um, and uh, again, we, um, we've been successful in a team science award. That was in the area of rare melanomas. And it was with two other investigators that had very different um, areas of expertise from myself. And we teamed together. In terms of mechanisms to, to think about um, how to um, apply or to essentially fine tune the, the proposals. One thing that we did within our cancer center was to um, have program meetings. So there are programs of excellence within our cancer center and really push the idea of having meetings where um, investigators pitched an idea, especially for the idea awards. And uh, we were able to um, you know, give feedback on those ideas and then um, have about half a dozen um, applications come out of the program to uh, the DOD as a result of that. And so I think it was very encouraging um, for the investigators to, to um, get feedback on their idea and, and know how to um, you know, move forward with a DOD application. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the ways that I think about um, applying to the DOD. Okay, thank you. So um, lots of scientists have experience applying for funding from NIH, um, but CDMRP is different. Are there any tips or lessons you've learned you can share with the audience? I think that, that there are many different mechanisms that are quite different in the DOD um, portfolio. 
And, you know, for example, I think the IDEA award is one example in which you just do not need preliminary data. Um, a typical NIHR01 is, is often more conservative. And um, the, the idea of high risk, high reward is really viewed quite highly, I think, uh, for that particular mechanism. I'll also give a, a shout out to the scholar awards. I think that this is a really important mechanism that, that the DOD has introduced. Um, these are for early stage investigators um, and the, uh, the, the fundees are going to be linked through to an academy leadership team. Um, I don't know if that academy leadership team has been announced yet, but I think they're going to be two experts in the field um, that will provide mentoring and networking for those scholars. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity. I would really encourage um, early stage investigators to apply for those scholar awards. Okay, thank you. And I, I was just gonna weigh in, Tanisha. I think, Andrew, I, I agree with you. The, the unique award mechanism is really interesting at uh, DOD. And I, I think the Scholars Academy is outstanding, um, of course, as, as well the IDEA and team awards. But I also really do like them trying to address this mid-career faculty sort of you must be must be seven years beyond your first appointment, but you're not yet a full professor. I think there's a huge cadre of investigators that can be supported in that mechanism. I agree. Okay, so we have a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, one question is, do metastases count as rare melanoma? And are there specific rare melanomas that especially impact the DOD community? So yes, metastases um, do count within the, the rare melanoma um, funding portfolio. Um, they're looking, they're very clear in terms of they want to fund the full spectrum of um, the disease process with those rare melanomas. I think that the, the rare melanomas that are perhaps most obvious would be acral, mucosal, uveal, um, conjunctival. Um, I, think that, I think that answers the question. And an additional question, uh, the Academy Scholars the Academy of Scholar Award requires the career guide to participate in the Melanoma Academy. What kind of time commitment does that entail? To the career guide, I think that that, um, I don't know if that is actually laid out in terms of a percent effort, but I think it's important for the career guide to be committed. So let me let me be clear. The the academy structure is um, to have leaders, and I believe that there are two leaders. But then each scholar applies with a career guide. I think that guide may or may not be from that host from the scholars host institution. I think the career guide performs a very important role. Um, they will typically know the scholar quite well, they'll know the personality, and will be able to actually um, give advice to the leadership team in terms of the career progression um, of, of the scholars. So it's, um, it's a commitment, um, and I think it's a commitment to the, the career progression of the scholar. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? You can unmute yourself and ask a question or add it to our chat. Okay, one question. Could you tell us what the key fo focuses are for the assessment of the Team Science Award? Is the focus on the strength of the team, the hypotheses, or the number of projects within the effort? Thank you for the question. That's actually a reviewing question. And um, so I can tell you my opinion, but I think that um, you know the the perhaps more um, insightful answers would come from the the uh, reviewing panels of DoD. I think that um, 
I think the science is it will be most important and will be reviewed um, and uh, will be the main score driving um, part of the application. I do think that the strength of the team and the fact that they might already be working together is an advantage. And the other part, which is, I think what I said before, is the idea of complementary expertise. So in the Team Science Award that we have funded, it was one investigator who is a true, it was, it's a uveal melanoma Team Science Award, uh, one investigator who has expertise in the, in the mechanisms of G-protein coupled receptor signaling, one investigator that is, um, you know, ha is an expert in tumor cell dormancy. And then I was lucky enough to, to go along for the ride. Great, thank you. And to follow up on Dr. Patton's question, a question about specific rare melanomas that impact DOD communities. So um, about 40% of active duty uh, military members are people of color and some rare forms of melanoma affect people of color more often than um, others. So that's an area of interest for designing studies. So now we'll move on to Ed Ackerley. He's a program manager at University of Notre Dame and we'll pose a few questions for him. Uh, William, can you unmute yourself? Or Ed, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, so Ed, thank you for joining us. And from the grants administrator side, can you provide any tips for other grant administrators and PIs? about applying for DOD CDMRP funding. Yeah, um, and again, thank you for um, letting me be um, part of this and um, for the um, various organizations that are uh, involved in uh, making this possible. I think it's a, it's a great, um, great help and great support. And hopefully you guys get um, some stuff out of this because the DOD is a good um, organization to work with. Um, and um, I kind of touch on some of the points um, that, um, that that you guys talked about earlier. Um, one of the things is that there are um, some similarities um, between the, um, the NIH and the DID, DOD, but there are some differences. And the two most important ones that I would point out, well, one is that the, um, the submission system that they use, it, the application goes in through grants.gov, but they have a system that's called um, EBRAP. Um, and that kind of works as um, ERA Commons, if you guys are um, familiar with that, where that's where the um, application actually ends up. And it's kind of like ERA Commons that you have an opportunity to review all the application materials um, and do that there. So um, you use grants.gov, but they, they do have, you can think about it that way, that EBRAP is similar to um, ERA Commons. Um, a, a very important thing that I would point out, um, one of the, the differences is that typically um, NIH uh, applications or uh, the budgets for them, it's based on direct costs. And if you have a subaward, um, the indirect costs for that subaward don't factor into the, when you're getting close to the total to decide whether it um, you know, meets the limit for a modular budget or for a detailed budget, or if you're exceeding the, the direct cost limit for the program. Where the DOD, they have a, a slightly different take on that. And um, typically, and it's all spelled out in the, um, in the guidelines. Um, but they typically, it's a, they have a direct cost limit, but the direct cost limit includes both the directs and indirects of any sub um, recipients that are included in that. And that kind of trips them up. I know I work with a, a PI um, here at Notre Dame that, that applies often to this, and he often gets caught up um, not remembering that. And um, when he's working with his collaborators when they're switching, because often they'll submit to both to an NIH program and to a DOD program. and you do have to make some adjustments to the budget to um, um, to, to to doing that. Um, the uh, I guess one of the other things that I could quickly say um, is read the guidelines. The it, it is the DoD is similar to um, the NIH, and that is that all of the NIH, like the NIH, well, it doesn't seem like they try. Well, it well it might seem like they're trying to hide um, information because the the FOAs and the instructions are long and they're all the information that you need is in there. 
sometimes it's very hard to find, but it's all in there. And that's the same thing with the DOD is that um, pretty much all of the information that you need to complete the application is in their um, program announcement and the instructions. It just be, might be very hard to find um, specific because like they put the formatting instructions that's buried deep within the, the, the actual instructions and you've got to kind of search for it. Um, but, but it is out there. And so if you're not finding it, it's just something that, you, that you've got to look for. Um, but the information is there and they're definitely not trying to hide anything um, from, from applicants. And, and uh, it may be a little bit difficult to find, but they're not trying to hide anything. Okay. So, can, a, oh, go ahead, Tanisha. No, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say thanks, um, Ed and, and Andrew. I was going to weigh in. You know, we at, we at MRA have actually applied to the DOD. Um, they had some calls for proposals for research resources and patient registries. So we um, have applied to three times to the DOD and got two of them funded. And so I would just say to all the scientists on the call that really you should start your writing early because the EBRAP is enough different than um, than NIH system that uh, I would say to start early on, on writing your documents. And then Andrew, I don't know if you agreed but I found that many of the documents that were required um, are sometimes repetitive. I felt like we were telling our story, uh, sometimes repeating ourselves from the main narrative to how we were going to disseminate the information and things like that. Yes, there, there is some overlap, but actually, um, I think it's important that there are some of the documents that are um, tailored to certain types of reviewers. And, and one of the points I should have brought up at, at the start is I believe that there are patient advocates on the reviewing panel. And so some of the documents are likely to be reviewed by patient advocates and scored by patient advocates. And that's important for a, a, a scientist writing a grant to keep in mind. That's a great point. And then Ed, you raised a really important point buried in the instructions is the uh, margins and the font fonts you can use and font sizes. And I know on one of our submissions, our 10 page narrative turned out to be 12 pages when we corrected the margins and font. And so we had about three hours to fix it before submission. So um, definitely people should look at the instructions carefully. Yep, and, and that is a difference between um, NIH and um, the, the DOD that, that usually, um, I think the margins are the same. You can have half inch margins um, on the documents, but um, typical NIH um, is Arial 11 point font and the DOD is Times New Roman. Um, and I think it's, it's 12 point or it might be 11 point, but, but it, there is a difference that they, um, that they, they do want. The, another quick thing that I wanted to, to bring up um, is that um, the, uh, um, there's a, as similar with uh, the uh, NSF and then NIH and their other support documents that there's been a lot of um, changes in, in how they want to, to do that. Well, um, the DOD, I don't know that there's really been a change because they're still using the same, they're still requesting the same information and, and they haven't really done it. The, they require something that's called a previous current and pending support document. Um, and they want like five years, the five past years of your funding history to go along with it. And those are, at least from a research administrator perspective, those are difficult documents for us to, to generate and they do take a, a, a significant amount of time. And so that's something that you don't want to, um, if, if you're interested in applying, you wanna get, get started on those and get your research office if they're support, help supporting that or, or you yourself to, to get started and, and doing on that. The tricky thing about the DOD is that um, they've requested these things all along, but they haven't, like the NIH has come out and said, these need to be certified and it has to be an electronic signature. And that's the only thing that we're going to accept. The DOD hasn't been really specific in what they, they want. And even um, my kind of interpretation of it is that you need to have it at the application stage, but they really don't look at it at the application stage because if you get selected for an award, they come back and they request that same information, update it. And I've even had some where they say, okay, update it. And then 
each institution of the investigator that's providing it, they have to certify that it's correct. So you end up having to plot, provide a letter that says, you know, all the information here is correct and we've certified this. And so um, that's, that's just one thing that, that that document is a little bit different from what um, goes into a, like an NIH other support where you don't have to provide that until they give you a just in time request. Um, but you do have to do that um, up front. And it is, um, it, it is something that can be time consuming. Um, especially if you're if, if there are well if you have investigators that are well funded and have um, existing support. Okay. There's a question in the chat about the reviewing process that I'll try and address really quickly. Um, it's a it's a two step reviewing process. Um, the first step is a reviewing panel that I believe is ad hoc. I think it often has a, a chair that um, likely has reviewed for DOD many times. Um, and it is run pretty much like an NIH study section. Um, the scoring scale is from 1.0 to 5.0, 1.0 being exceptional. Um, then those reviews go to the second step, which is a um, a panel that is um, uh, stable from year to year and really is overseeing all of the, the, the melanoma um, related uh, applications and is viewing the scores, but is also thinking about the priority areas and uh, is really trying to make decisions based upon not just the scores, but making sure that there is breadth of research across the priority areas that um, are to be supported by the DOD. Okay, um, any additional questions? Dr. Applin, would you have any um, advice for resubmitting versus reapplying for the next funding opportunity? I would resubmit. Um, it's it's very similar to NIH, though, that you can't guarantee that you'll get, you know, the same reviewers again. So, um, and I don't think there's a section of of the DoD grants that is a response to reviewers. Um, but uh, I think if you are close the first time, then I would um, just think about um, you know addressing the reviewers' points and making sure that it does. Um, that the subject area is tailored to um, the areas, the priority areas that the DOD is looking to fund. I also saw something that popped up real quick that somebody had asked about um, the LOIs, because usually there's an LOI that is due for um, the, uh, the DOD and it has to be submitted through EBRAP. And if you read the, the guidelines, um, they'll say whether that, because sometimes they say you have to submit an LOI, like, two weeks before the application is due. And oftentimes with those, the LOIs are not reviewed. Um, if there is, if, they, if the LOI does have to be reviewed and then they invite the application, they, um, they give you enough time that, that there's, there's significant more time that they don't expect you to put it in an LOI and then you know, turn around and, and do it. That, that they'll, they'll give you more time than that. So um, just read the guidelines and see which, which, which mechanism they're using and that if it's, if it's invited or if everybody who submits an LOI is automatically allowed to submit. Okay, we have a question from the audience, Nara Shana. And if you have to leave, please you know, feel free to drop off. But we'll stay here for a few more minutes to answer any questions. Nara Shana, thank you. you can. Um, thank you, Tanisha. And thank you to the whole panel for doing this. Um, Andrew, especially, I think my question's kind of geared towards you, you know, it's, um, I think sometimes it's challenging to read these disease area specific instructions and you're trying to in some way fit your work to say, am I in this area, am I in that area? And for things like prevention, it's kind of clear. And for things like rare melanomas, it can be really clear. But for things like immune, you know, immune responses and predicting response to checkpoint therapy or for clinical outcomes research, um, and then even some of the mechanistic underpinnings of that, it feels like it all falls into this waste paper basket of like tumor microenvironment. And a lot of people could be applying within that category. Do you have any comments about like sort of, you know, strategies to kind of gear your application to be very specific and state, like, should we be stating this application is responsive to this priority area? Or is it something that you more hope that the reviewers will pull out? I spell it out to the reviewers. Um, you know, I think that you, you can tailor those types of questions 
to earlier stage disease. And I would spell it out to the reviewers. Got it, thank you. Okay. And I would kind of add to that, that um, I think that when they put, put together these, um, that they, they're very specific in their, um, that it's not just kind of a general thing, that it's, it's tailored and they're looking for specific, um, specific things in there. So if it's, if you're having trouble kind of fitting it into there, that, that might be something that you would talk to a program officer about um, or something like that, that it's not just um, open and stuff like that, that they're, they're issuing calls that are, like the, something has gone into the development of that call and why they're interested in um, pursuing that, that, specific, um, that specific program and why they're offering. Yeah, it's really confusing because sometimes like people will even reach out to our group and say we want you to apply for this mechanism but then you read the instructions and you're like i don't know that we fit this mechanism perfectly or that you know it's it's part of it it's hard because you know some aspects of the mechanism are very general um like very specific areas are designed to be very specific i think and then the, like everything else that's mechanistic is in like under one particular area and i don't know if other people on the call find that you know that um, it's almost like here are the three priority areas that are new. And by the way, we threw a category together in case there's other really important stuff that could fall under these other categories. And, and so I totally hear you, William. It's just it's challenging sometimes. Okay. Uh, Tanisha's um, just put a really important point in the chat. Um, there are really um, good people to reach out to at DOD. So Amy Bunker. Um, is um, the name of the program manager for the MRP. She's very responsive, very easy to talk to, and answered a lot of my questions when I've, I've been applying. Okay, and Ed, do you have time to answer one more question? Yeah. Someone posed a question, can you review the direct versus indirect funds for DOD grants? Yes, um, so usually, and, and usually it's all spelled out in the, um, the, the program announcement for the opportunity. And it's usually, it's towards the end, they have a section that I think is um, budget limits or, or it's something about the budgets that it's at the end and it tells you, um, you know what what the operative it lays out and it, it's kind of weird because usually nih those are at the beginning and you would you would see those those things there but there it's usually towards the end and it will say you know um that you know this opportunity provides two hundred thousand dollars per year um indirect costs um for that so obviously that means that the your direct costs um have to be under two hundred thousand dollars a year and indirect costs are in addition to that and you don't have to worry about violating some um, limit on that. The, the one thing to throw in there is that the DOD typically categorizes that if you have a sub recipient on there that the total costs of the sub recipient go into your, your direct cost limit. So that means that your sub, you have to count their direct costs and their indirects. So um, like with, a, with an NIH, Let's say you're going to do a, um, uh, uh, you know, an R01 modular budget. You're going to say, oh, okay, we'll have um, $150,000 per year for this. And my collaborator is going to have $100,000 for this. And you just add that up. That's two fifty. dollars Okay, we're within the um, direct cost limit. For the DOD, it, it works a little bit different in that you have to count the indirect costs of your, um, of your collaborator into that total cost. So if, if you were doing that, you'd have to make some adjustments because 150 of yours would count towards the, the limit, but then $100,000 from your subrecipient plus whatever their indirect costs are, let's say it's 50%, there'd be another $50,000 per year that would have to be factored into that. Um, and, and also in that budget section, there's usually something that they'll put in um, other things about, well, okay, this is how much you can request for travel or we're expecting you to request funds you know, to go to a, an annual DOD meeting um, and with the, with the program officers and, you know, kind of a, an update meeting. Um, so, so that stuff is usually in the, that budget section there. All right, thank you. 
Okay, so if do we have any more questions? I'd like to ask a question. Okay, do we have time for one more question? Dr. Applin and Ed? I do. Okay. okay. You can ask your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Oh, you're on mute. Dr. Katzer, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Okay, now you can ask your question. Yes. So my question is, I'm an Israeli and I'm a physicist and I collaborate with German uh, scientists in the area of melanoma. Can one get support for multinational research, uh, researchers? My, my understanding is that, that international applications are accepted. That's, that's my understanding. I would... Uh, I would strongly su suggest you you contact the um, Amy Bunker just to verify that before you you write and submit. But that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. And and, and I would add to that that um, even if it is that obviously because it's a DoD, you're specifically and some of the things that they one of the documents that they ask you to provide, and I think it's something that's very important. I haven't been involved in review process or know how, how it's looked at, but they ask you, what is the impact on um, the military? You know, what is the military relevance of this? So you would have to be very specific in your, um, you know, in that and saying that, yes, even though we're, um, you know, we're involving institutions from, you know, Germany or something in this, this is how it is going to benefit US military personnel and, and, you, and, and sometimes that's, that's an easy thing to, to make, but, but that is just something that you're going to have to do. Um, and, and I think it's something that, because that's what they're looking for, um, that it's not something to just be, just kind of pass over and say, oh, well, it's just a supporting document. There's not, you really have to look at what the, um, you know, okay, how is it going to impact, uh, you know, what is the military relevance of this, um, of this project that I'm proposing? Okay. Okay, and Dr. Katzer, uh, we have noticed that some investigators from Israel have had trouble accessing the DOD website. So please uh, consider emailing Dr. Bunker uh, to discuss issues with their um, project. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this webinar. We appreciate your interest, and we hope that all of you will submit applications to this funding opportunity to get us a few more steps closer to curing melanoma. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Andrew Alpin, Applin sorry, for participating and answering so many questions. And Ed Ackerley, thank you so much for your wisdom on uh, supporting investigators applying for this funding opportunity. Um, it can be kind of a heavy administrative burden sometimes, but uh, the payoff is uh, projects supported to cure melanoma. And we appreciate everybody's work on that. All right. And feel free to email me or Amy Bunker if you have any questions. And I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you.